Hey everybody, Moses here. I'm excited to be diving back into our Magical Hebrew series. As some of you know, a lot's happened since the last video in this series, including me blowing myself up in the alchemy lab and growing a beard. And I appreciate your patience as all that has unfolded and played out. I'm truly thrilled to be back and better resource to continue producing this series, and I hope you'll appreciate the improvement in production and quality. So today we'll be looking at the mystical figure of Solomon. We encounter this figure in Samuel Liddell McGregor Mather's translation of Clavicula Solomonis, the Key of Solomon, from 1889. And there it's labeled as Figure 1, the mystical figure of Solomon. Mathers wrote about this figure that it's only given in two of the manuscripts he looked at, Lansdowne Manuscripts 1202 and 1203. It was also given by Eliphas Levy in his Doctrine and Ritual of High Magic, and Mathers says it was given by Tycho Brahe in his Calendarium Naturale Magicum Perpetuum, which wasn't actually written by Brahe, but it does appear in the calendar. As Mathers goes on, he says, but in each instance it was given without the Hebrew words and letters. Probably, he says, because these were so mangled by what he calls illiterate transcribers as to be, quote, unrecognizable. He says, after much labor and study of the figure, he believes the words in the body of the symbols to be intended for the ten Sephi wrote, arranged in the form of the Tree of Life, with the name of Solomon to the right and left, while the surrounding characters are intended for the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and he has therefore thus restored them. I can say this is absolutely a curious figure, and we don't find it in every edition or translation, but it definitely seems to have been conceptually in usage by at least 1620, and that's when it appeared in the Tables of the Fathers, attributed to King Solomon. We encounter it again in about half a century later in the second part of the Art of King Solomon, the Lamegaton. There it's referred to as the Table of Art, which is, quote, truly called the secret table of Solomon. That earliest reference to this figure, which I have confirmed the best I could with the incredible footnotes that Joseph H. Peterson keeps over on esotericarchives.com, is that appearance in the Calendarium Naturale Magicum Perpetuum from around 1620. Now, what's curious is that Calendarium draws heavily in a lot of places from Agrippa's second book on occult philosophy, from around 1533. And Agrippa didn't include this symbol at all. But he did include a really interesting cipher created of partial square and angled crosses which would be combined to encode a number. Now, it isn't the case for all of the tables of the fathers given in the calendarium that if we look at them with this code we can make sense of it. But if we look at Agrippa's tables against our figure in question, we notice that it's primarily composed of square and angled crosses. Here we have an upright square cross, and here is the upright angled cross. Now, in Agrippa's code, the upright square cross is equal to 22, and the upright Y or angle cross equals 44. We'll come back to those numbers in just a second here. And I do want to indicate that we are sort of just exploring. And as we move to interpret the bottom of this symbol, which differs a little depending on the version we're working with, it becomes clear that this may not be quite as fruitful an exploration. If we go with the version in the Calendarium, we get this figure, which would equal 7700. The shape we see in the Key of Solomon, on the other hand, doesn't correspond at all to Agrippa's code because it has this little bit sticking down. We'll revisit this little bit and why Mathers may have emphasized that in a moment. But what does it mean? What were those numbers and how might this be connected? Well, I haven't come across anyone connecting these figures with Agrippa's code, so I'm completely spitballing here, and I've certainly not found anyone who has been interpreting them. This is pure freewheeling. But the cross that equals 22 has the same value in Hebrew gematria as zevka, sacrifice. Zayin is 7, bet is 2, chet is 8, he is 5, equaling 22. Meanwhile, that Y shape would equal 44 in Agrippa's code, which is the gematria value of Dom, which is blood. Dalet is 4 and Mem is 40. That gives us 44. So this theory is intriguing, especially for a Christian Kabbalist who might be interested particularly in the sacrifice and the blood on the cross. 
but it wouldn't explain the bottom of the shape, which either equals something that's not in the code, or in best case, 7700. Of course, high number gamatria can be hard to impossible to crack, even using computers. There's such a large number of phrases that can add up to that, that there's no way we can know what it represents. The most interesting association we might find is purely coincidental, but pretty neat. Strong's Concordance is a really neat English language biblical reference that gives a number to each word that appears in the Bible, and the number 7700 does appear in Strong's, with the equivalence of the word shed, shin dalet, which means demon. And it's very tempting to say this is a promising connection, given Solomon's famous control over demons and the purported purpose of this very symbol. And Strong's Concordance is an awesome book that I find incredibly useful for biblical study. But James Strong didn't write the Concordance until 1890. And the numbers he used aren't any sort of traditional reference or anything. He came up with his own numbering system. So they definitely would not have been known when this figure was being formed a few centuries earlier even if Agrippa's code was known at the time. So it's possible that the top indicates 22 plus 44 in indicating blood and sacrifice. Again, probably appealing concepts to a Christian magician who would be working with it. Uh, maybe it would indicate 66 the total, which shares the gematria with Gilgul, which means a cycle or a wheel of reincarnation that is referred to in Kabbalistic texts. But maybe it's just a coincidence. We can also consider that maybe that 22 is equivalent to the number of letters in Hebrew, the Hebrew alphabet, which circumscribed the entire figure. That said, we're told this figure is, like most of the kind of general figures in Goetia, used to terrify demons and spirits into submission. And this is the context that we receive it in, in the greater key of Solomon. So without further ado, let's look deeper at this demon-terrifying mystical figure of Solomon. We'll start creating this one using the pentacle stencils so we can make nice, neat circles. You can use your drawing compass, but for me, this is by far the quickest and easiest way. Again, if you want to make a set of these pentacle stencils for yourself, no problem. Go check out the link in the description below to the file you can throw into your plotter or your laser cutter and get a perfectly made set. So once we've created our circles, we are going to go ahead and ink the olive bet around the edge of the circle. I like to start by marking out and identifying sort of the cardinal positions, the 12 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 6 o'clock, and 3 o'clock, and make sure that these match the diagram we're trying to make. So if we look back at Mather's diagram, we see that he has olive at 12, Lamed is set at 6, the 9 o'clock is sort of between Vav and Zayin, and then the 3 o'clock is between Pei and Sadi. So we can go ahead and sort of pencil those characters in at those locations with the idea that we'll ink them in later. So with those penciled, we can now go around and ink the Aleph over the pencil and ink the letters on over to the penciled Vav, ink the Vav, and continue accordingly. The idea is we want to ink everything in order. But it's okay to go ahead and pencil our references first. So once we finish the Aleph Bet, the outer ring of the circle is complete. I always like to do the outer ring first. Because whatever is in the outer ring of a magical circle is there to contain what's inside. In this case, everything inside is beneficent. We're evoking King Solomon, maybe his wisdom... But as we move on to make the pentacles of Saturn and the pentacles of Mars and things, we're definitely going to want to make sure we're containing those energies. So let's start creating good habits with good practice, and let's make the outer ring of containment first. So now that we've got a solid Aleph Bet containing what we put inside, we'll turn our attention to the body of the figure here. And the body gives us kind of two primary figures or shapes with some text. So we're going to start by looking a little deeper, by breaking down and unpacking these a little. The first shape is the cross figure that we saw from the calendarium. And then we've got this kind of thin-lined figure interlaced with it. We see one end of it has a flat line and the other has this kind of open bracket part. Now, we don't have it indicated here in any way or in any of these texts. But when we see that shape, a flat line on one end and a bracket or a circle on the other, 
we're often looking at a sigil constructed on a numerical magic square. The open part is the first number or letter and the closed part or the flat line is the end. We can sit here and try to crack this code as to what this sigil might mean, but unless we immediately recognize it, which I do not, and if one of you does, please drop it in the comments, it's kind of a long shot. The line's also a little stylized by the time we're looking at it in this figure, and it's not totally obvious if it would be a five or six letter word that the sigil is based on, because uh, of that shape in the beginning could be one or two letters. And of course, we have no idea what magic square it might be laid out on. We don't know if this comprises the whole square. We can only infer some things. Unfortunately, the obvious guess for what it might spell, Shlomo, which would be Hebrew for Solomon, only has four letters. So that one's out. And adding to the challenge, it's definitely possible and seems pretty likely that the shape as we're looking at it has been stylized. So the proportions may have been changed and we can't even interpret them to infer the size of the square. I looked through my immediately available sources for a couple of hours and I came up dry. So I don't intend to speculate, but if anyone can place or identify this shape as a magic square sigil or any other sigil, definitely let me know. So whether we know what this sigil signifies or not, that we recognize it as a magic square sigil does help us know that we should start forming it from the open bracket at the bottom right, ending at the line at the top left. So now we know we're going to form the cross shape from the calendarium with a couple differences. First, the angular arms in the calendarium become these kind of triangle wedge shapes uh, in Mathers. Second, the figure in the center in the calendarium has a flat bottom, but Mathers has it extend down. This little bit extending down does seem to jive with Mather's Kabbalistic framework. He places the Hebrew word yesod there, and this is the Kabbalistic realm corresponding to the male reproductive organ, which hangs down. So we might want to experiment with those two modifications, maybe creating it with the Y arms instead of the wedges, and maybe we want to work with the flat bottom. But for this video, as we're going to work on the Mathers version, we're going to use the triangles instead of the diagonals, and we're going to leave that little bit dangling down to create the yesod. Once we make that figure, then we're going to have to create the magic square sigil, and then there's all this text. So let's look at that. Now, the text as we have it here is given by Mathers, and it's comprised of three parts. We have the ten sefi wrote of the Kabbalistic Tree of Life, laid out as we expect. Keter, Chochma, Bina, Da'at, Gedula, Gevura, Tiferet, Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. Then up on the diagonals up here, or the wedges, we have Av, father on the right side, and Ima, mother, on the left. Now, Mather's spelling here is a little dubious. Ima is usually just Aleph, Mem, Aleph, and he's added a Yud in here. And since we know from his footnotes that Mathers did the Hebrew himself, and because he had so much disdain for illiterate transcribers, I feel okay correcting his spelling here for the sake of literate transcription. Around the edges of this magic square sigil shape, shape we have that four-letter word repeated twice, Shin Lamed Mem He. That spells Shlomo, Solomon. Okay, so now we have our plan and we're ready to create the figure, but researching this video led me to consider something that I want to explore a little here. What if Mather's base assumption was close, but not quite right? Mather's assumed that the figures around the ring had to be the Hebrew alphabet, even though what he was looking at was something like this. What's for certain is that there are 22 figures, at least in this 1750s rendering here, which seems to include astrological characters, some Latin characters, a couple Hebrew letters, and some other assorted shapes. Now, we also have this other 1750s French version of the figure, and they seem to be closer to perhaps a single alphabet, but... Counting the figures seems very hard, and if they are an alphabet, it's definitely not Hebrew. When we look at famous French occultist Eliphas Levy, he's of virtually no help to us. He gives us his version, and he's removed everything from the outer ring except the four letters of Solomon's name. So, Mathers probably deduced 22 symbols, 22 Hebrew letters, and just built off that assumption saw that figure, thought it could be a tree of life, and started labeling. But let's look at that. Let's look at some of the Hebrew scripts that we may have been working with at Mather's time and before. 
when these things were written and when he was studying them. For this, we're going to look at Edmund Fry's Pantographia, written in 1799. It would have been very well known to Mathers, and most of this information would have been contemporaneous and known to educated individuals and practitioners, especially among the French occultists who Mathers was working from the texts of. Fry gives us 11 different Hebrew alphabets. Many of them are relatively lost or obscure these days. A couple of them we still use. Uh, some of them are very specialized. The second and third of these alphabets that he gives us, he intriguingly attributes to King Solomon, writing, These two alphabets are attributed to King Solomon by Theseus Ambrosius in his Appendice des Differentes Letres et des Differentes Lenguas. Pardon me if I got that wrong. I speak Hebrew, not Latin. But he does not offer any authority. He also asserts that the prince had many treatises written in them, of which Apollonius Thyanius was the translator and commentator. Now this is really intriguing because the prince here he's referring to is Solomon, and Apollonius Thyanius is also known as Apollonius of Tyana, who's a significant Greek miracle worker, mystic, and magician. A lot of grimoire magic that we're touching comes through Apollonius's hands. So maybe these figures really were one of Apollonius's Solomonic Hebrew alphabets. Feel free to experiment with those alphabets from Pantographia if you'd like. I'll put a link in the description. So maybe it was a var variant Hebrew alphabet. Maybe it was standard Aleph Bet. Or maybe it was another language altogether. While most of the alphabets we find in Pantographia are more than 22 letters, one other 22-letter alphabet sticks out. Chaldean, the language of the patriarch Abraham, from which the Hebrew magical tradition was derived, is also a 22-letter alphabet. Pantographia gives us 18 different Chaldean scripts, some of which are definitely used in a variety of magical seals, symbols, and grimoires, and wouldn't necessarily be out of place here. So while all of this is incredibly enriching and intriguing, without enough info to discern this for ourselves, and with Mr. Mathers having taken the trouble to do it all in Hebrew for us, and given that this is a series on Hebrew, we're just going to go ahead and do it in Hebrew. Here we go.
that's how we make the mystical figure of Solomon. On the right, you can see the one I made. On the left, you can see Mather's. One might argue that my lettering is a little better, his figure is a little more proportionate, but given that I was rushing and not measuring anything, I think it came out pretty good. I definitely encourage you to practice it a few times, you know, on paper before you start to consider doing it on parchment or wherever you're going to do it finally and ultimately. But as you can see, it's pretty easy to form. Uh, I like to use the letters on the outside as reference points. When you saw me making it, you kind of see me line up the diagonal of the sigil line. Um, Mathers brings it up to the kof. I brought it up to the tzadi just so I could split it kind of in the middle of the page. But using the kind of the angles of the letters uh, and lining your straight edge up with them is going to help you get everything proportional in the way you want it. Definitely feel free to interpret it. That's another point that I absolutely have to make. If we look at all of these different uh, iterations of this image, we can see that they're not all universal. They're not all exactly alike. There is some individual expression and some individual intention being put into them. So as we look at these all together and take them as a whole, I think we can find there's plenty of room to create the one the way you want. So I hope this lesson was really useful. I greatly appreciate you checking out another episode of this series. Uh, go back and review the earlier episodes if you haven't already. Check out the links in the comments, and I'll see you with the next one for the first Pentacle of Saturn.